Congress. 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 Congress shall make no law. Make no law respecting an establishment. An establishment of religion. Or prohibiting the free. The free exercise thereof. Or bridging the freedom. The freedom. The freedom of speech. Or the press. Or the right. Or the right of the people peaceably. Peaceably. Peaceably assemble. And to petition the government a redress of grievances. Hello, my name is Dr. Kevin A. Johnson, and I'm here with Dr. Craig R. Smith, who is the director of the Center for First Amendment Studies at California State University, Long Beach. We're here to discuss his book, Silencing the Opposition, which takes a look at the historical approaches that government have taken to silence speech throughout the nation's history. I'd like to begin by talking about the way in which we have evolved in the particular controversies. In each particular crisis, it stems from the beginning of the crisis, emerging with two different sides that conflict, and then the resolution of the crisis. So let's begin with the need for the First Amendment. What are some of the needs that were first established in establishing the Constitution? Well, what a lot of people don't understand is that when we passed the Constitution in uh, uh, 1789, there was no Bill of Rights, there was no First Amendment in it. And so the first crisis was, how do we get the Bill of Rights adopted in? And there was a compromise made where the state of Massachusetts ratified the Constitution on the condition that a Bill of Rights would be added. And then Virginia did the same thing. So two years later, we finally got the Bill of Rights added to the Constitution, but it had to be ratified as 10 different amendments around the country. And what were some of the initial controversies that occurred about the First Amendment? Well, initially, James Madison and Alexander Hamilton believed that a Bill of Rights was not necessary because the Constitution said, anything we don't claim here in this Constitution belongs to the states. So their assumption was, because the states had a Bill of Rights, that the states would take care of that problem. Patrick Henry said, oh no, I don't trust you. I want the Bill of Rights in the Constitution. And that's what the debate was over. So who were the two sides that were in favor and opposing the First Amendment as being established in the Constitution? Generally, the Federalist Party opposed putting the Bill of Rights into the Constitution because they followed Hamilton. And the Anti-Federalists were in favor of putting the Bill of Rights in because they were afraid of too strong a central government taking away minority rights. And James Madison was converted by Thomas Jefferson to the Anti-Federalist Party, and that's how the Bill of Rights got in. So how did the First Amendment get written and evolve into its form that we see in the Constitution? Once the Congress came together after the initial Constitution was put in place, uh, the states were allowed to submit amendments to the House of Representatives for, uh, and the Senate to be included in the Constitution, and 200 different amendments came in. Now, many of them were overlapping, they combined things, and eventually Madison wrote the strongest language he could into the First Amendment, which begins, Congress shall make no law. And then he incorporated several different amendments into that one. So I imagine after it was written that there was a lot of contestation over the passage of this First Amendment. Yeah, it, it went out to the states. Actually, there was a pack, package of 12 amendments, and the first two were rejected. The First Amendment was the third in that group, and it became the first when the first two were rejected. So what were the initial representations that had, that had happened about the First Amendment in the states? One of the things that went on during the Revolutionary War, for example, was that there were underground newspapers that spread the word. When, when Patrick Henry gave his speech against the Stamp Act in 1765, that speech was carried in underground newspapers all the way to Boston. And the Sons of Liberty were formed based on that speech. If they hadn't read about it in underground newspapers, that might not have happened. So freedom of press was guaranteed because of the role the press had pay, played during the Revolution. Were there any stumbling blocks to the passing of the First Amendment in terms of its ratification? I think the main stumbling block was over the freedom of religion clauses. One says you have the right to exercise religion freely, which means you can believe what you want to believe. And the other says that the government shall make no law restricting or establishing religion. So um, there were ministers in the country that were both in favor of that and opposed to that. Uh, the tradition out of England was that there was a church state, the Anglican uh, church, 
And so there, there was controversy over that. There was also controversy over the fifth clause in the First Amendment, uh, freedom to assemble peaceably. People often forget that word is in the First Amendment. It says we can assemble, but it says peaceably. And that was put in there because they didn't want people just rioting. They didn't want to say you have a right to riot you have a right to violent protest, you, it has to be peaceable. And so there was a debate over that also. So how did all of these debates about the First Amendment get resolved by the government? Well, first of all, the House and the Senate had to agree in conference as to what amendments would be submitted to the state. So they got the list down to 12, and it took them a long time to get that down to 12. Then that went out to the, that, that package was then approved in the House and the Senate by a three quarters vote, and then it went out to the states for ratification. And finally, over a two-year period, it got ratified. 1791, in December of 1791, was when the Bill of Rights was finally added to the Constitution. And then after 1791, one of the first crises that we had toward challenging the First Amendment was the Alien and Sedition Crisis. What were some of the conditions that gave, ro gave rise to this particular crisis? Well, the big problem was that while we were passing the Constitution in 1789, the Bastille fell in France. And when the Bastille fell, it led to the French Revolution. The French Revolution went crazy. It got completely out of hand. Even the leaders of the rebels were beheaded eventually. The king and queen were killed, uh, sent to the mm -hmm. guillotine. And so there was a great fear that this, uh, what was called terror, and it was the first time the word was used in the English language and applied to a, a country, that the terrorism in France would spread to other countries. So England and France went to war with one another over all of these problems, and we got caught in the middle. We were neutral, but the French began to sink ships that were bringing supplies to England from the United States. And by 1796, when the crisis started, uh, 300 American ships had been sunk by the French. And so there was this fear of an external threat and that we needed to do something about it. And Hamilton led the Federalist Party to pass restrictions called the Alien and Sedition Acts. They dealt with, uh, it, it would take longer for an immigrant to become a citizen of the United States. Um, the sedition part was if you made fun of the government or the president, you could go to jail. Uh, a congressman was actually put in jail uh, uh, during this period of time. There was a panic in the country about philosophers who had come from France spreading the terror here in the United States, and they were exported. So it, it, those were the kind of factors that played into the crisis. There was the external crisis from France, mm -hmm. the internal crisis of subversion within the United States. And were there major opponents at the time to the Alien and Sedition Acts? Absolutely. Uh, Jefferson and Madison wrote resolves uh, in Virginia and in Kentucky opposing uh, the uh, Alien and Sedition Acts and actually claimed they were unconstitutional because they hadn't been properly uh, carried out and they violated the First Amendment and the state should nullify them and a, and a big controversy then set in. And how did those acts move toward a resolution of this particular crisis? The Alien and Sedition Acts were passed in 1798 and uh, many people were arrested around the country. Newspaper editors were jailed, as, as I said, one, one member of the House of Representatives. Um, but they had a sunset provision in them so that they would end on inaugural day, uh, 1800. So whoever won the presidency could extend them or let them lapse. And luckily for us, Thomas Jefferson won the presidency and he allowed the Alien Sedition uh, Acts to lapse. And how did Thomas Jefferson declare this? Well, in his uh, inaugural address, uh, he said that we were all Republicans and we were all Federalists and we were a united country and uh, therefore uh, we didn't need this kind of restriction on the First Amendment, and they were sunsetted. Interesting. Uh, I'd like to skip forward a little bit, because your book talks a little bit about the evolution of the suppression of speech, and, and we see the next crisis after the Alien and Sedition Acts occurred during the Civil War and the move toward abolition. And right. so what were some of the major crises that were developing leading on to the road toward abolition? Well, the first thing that happened uh, in 1830, the abolition movement got underway with the publication of a, of a newspaper called The Liberator uh, in Boston. Uh, the editors of that newspaper then decided that they were going to mail that newspaper into the South, which they did, and it led to some rioting because the South was opposed to ending slavery, obviously. And so the President of the United States, uh, Andrew Jackson, decided that he wanted to ban those newspapers from going into the South, which clearly was a violation. Uh, of, the, um, of the First Amendment, mm -hmm. and particularly its freedom of press clause. So he got 
uh, Senator Calhoun of South Carolina, John C. Calhoun, to introduce legislation that would ban the newspapers from coming in. Well, the Congress stood up for once mm -hmm. and, and turned down uh, that legislation. So Jackson had his Postmaster General, Amos Kendall, simply ban those newspapers from going into the states as the Postmaster General. So he engaged in really what I consider to be an unconstitutional restriction on press, and that was when the controversy really got uh, s severe. The other uh, sad thing that happened was a man named Lovejoy uh, had a printing press in Missouri, in Alton, mm -hmm. Missouri, and the press was burned down and he was killed for uh, putting out abolitionist, uh, an abolitionist newspaper. And so the abolition crisis swung around, first off, around freedom of press, and, and that really got highlighted mm -hmm. during that period of time. And then we moved to Abraham Lincoln, who also had his own share in suppressing free speech. Uh, can you talk a little bit about Abraham Lincoln and his role with the suspension of habeas corpus? Sure. At the, at the beginning of the Civil War, uh, the president was afraid that the state of Maryland would secede. Now, remember, they become a neutral state, kind of a, what was called a border state, along with Kentucky. Uh, and the legislature was going to come together, and they were going to meet and vote to secede. So the president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, ordered troops to prevent the Maryland legislature from meeting and suspended habeas corpus, your rights under the Bill of Rights. He suspended those rights in Maryland so that uh, they couldn't vote to secede. And that was a, a major step in preserving the Union, but it was probably, it, it would later be ruled uh, unconstitutional. So what were the major cases during this particular era that had to do with the government suppressing free speech rights? The first case was the Merriman case, um, and this was a man who was arrested, uh, he was incarcerated, but he wasn't in the field of battle, and therefore he argued that they had no right to suspend his habeas corpus. Uh, the uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Justice Taney, who was an enemy of Lincoln, wanted to bring that case to the court and try to expedite it, but the rest of the Supreme Court wouldn't go along with it because mm -hmm. it was wartime. And so they felt that there really was a threat, and therefore they allowed Merriman to stay in jail, uh, which was probably a very bad decision, but in wartime we restrict rights in the name of national security. The other case was the case of a man named Mulligan, and he, uh, Milligan, and Milligan was incarcerated and his case came up after the war ended. And Justice Davis then wrote the decision that is precedential to this time, that if you're arrested in an area where civil courts are available to you, you cannot be put in military prison. And so that was, that was the case that, that undid Merriman but it was, of course, after Lincoln's death and after the war was over. So how did the, the crisis during this time get resolved in a way that would be able to guarantee First Amendment rights and somewhat limit it because of this clear and present danger? Well, I think the lesson that we learned from the Civil War is that when we're at war, you're not going to have as many First Amendment rights uh, as you normally do. They're going to be restricted in the name of national security, and that's what happened. This, this crisis was not resolved until the war ended. Once the war ended, then the courts could take up a case and restore the rights that Lincoln had restricted, and that's what happened. Okay, so uh, when, when Abraham Lincoln was initially making these particular decisions, it, it wasn't without opposition to himself at the same time. Who were some of the major players that were opposing Lincoln at that time? Well, Democrats in the Congress were opposing Lincoln and, and arguing that he was taking dictatorial powers. Um, they were very defensive about what was going on. Many of these people uh, were called copperheads because they supported uh, the southern states. They called for negotiation with the South, the seceded states. Um, Lincoln had decided that this was a civil war, that those, the, the states that had seceded had done something they couldn't do under the Constitution, whereas the Democrats thought that they could do it and should be negotiated with as another nation. Lincoln refused that altogether. And so Copperhead newspapers were closed down by the government. Uh, the New York World at one point was closed down for putting out a call for people not to volunteer to go in the army. So there were restrictions on the press that were taking place, even though there was opposition to the president that was allowed to speak. 